I, um, right out of college, worked for a very interesting entrepreneurial company in Seattle called Macaw Cellular Communications, which um, in Seattle, when I was graduating from college, there were two companies that had really um, become kind of these giant startups. One was Macaw and one was Microsoft, um, started by two guys who went to the same high school. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and I worked for one of the founders um, looking at international opportunities and when, at, at Macaw, and when that company was sold to AT&T, the entire senior team um, ended up, they were all, you know, it was sort of former bankers and, you know, and entrepreneurs, obviously, but that group spawned an entire um, new group, like that whole senior management team went to Netscape, and um, and then a number of them started, you know, little venture funds themselves, and so I was exposed to it when I was 21 years old, and once you're exposed to it, I think you, I mean, you, you never want to leave, <laughs> um, and you figure out how to stay, so, um, and so, you know, I mean, I think that it was fortuitous that I got involved with something at, you know, at a very early stage in life, and that's why I think exposure is so important. Uh, we started Graycroft in, in 2006, and when we started, we started in both Los Angeles and New York at the same time. Um, in 2006, the iPhone didn't exist. Uh, a lot can happen in ten, <laughs> in 10 years, and um, you know, I think we're very um, fortuitous that, that in the two markets that we exist in New York and Los Angeles, um, just a, a lot of change has happened in the industries that are sort of native to those markets. And so in New York, um, certainly, you know, in, in finance and, you know, the sort of what happened in 2008, I think, drove a lot of interesting um, change and sort of migration of folks in New York. In Los Angeles, the entertainment industry and digital media, you know, the media industry largely has been going through, in, you know, just obviously a major, um, major change and continues to. So when we started Graycroft, we did start it with a, a core thesis that um, there were great outcomes um, in in M and A transactions. And in fact, if you look historically at the data, you know, 90 plus percent of all venture back companies exit through an M and A transaction, not through an IPO. So as much as we'd all love to have IPOs every day, it's just not realistic. And we tend to just invest kind of following the, the you know, sort of reality and data, both in terms of exits and also just in terms of valuation. Um, we uh, raised a growth fund uh, last year in 2014. Um, historically, we had been focused on early stage. Um, we started the fund in 2006, really, with a focus on Series A um, and sort of early Series B uh, stage um, uh, investing. And we raised a growth fund, which in some ways is a bit of a misnomer because everybody categorizes things slightly differently. Um, our view and version of a, of a venture growth fund, you know, sort of in our vernacular, is um, really sort of Series C and beyond. And where we saw an opportunity is essentially um, anything that was kind of um, uh, sort of not these billion dollar pre-IPO rounds. Um, the, the entire market um, uh, from kind of a growth perspective had really shifted toward these, you know, half a billion, billion dollar kind of valuations in what they called growth rounds. Um, and it left a bit of a void where there was, you know, for sort of Series Series C capital. I mean, that was really being just covered by um, folks doing sort of their pro rata um, shares in um, follow-on rounds. But that left sort of a void in terms of, of um, you know uh, investors to lead some of those rounds um, and and smaller rounds in opportunities that we think are terrific opportunities where you can certainly still make a great return and it doesn't have to be a billion dollar um, outcome. When you get to, at the end of the day, I mean, entrepreneurs come from all different backgrounds and always have. Um, and that's what I'm seeing is just really phenomenal women entrepreneurs. And, you know, we've backed, I think something, I mean, I can't remember the, you know, obviously the data always changes, but I think 20, 25% of our companies are either founded, co-founded, or run by women. Um, and that's still not as high as it should be. It obviously should be much, should be much higher. Um, but I, I, I see it happening. You know, in Los Angeles, there are, a lot, there's a lot of support, there's a lot of networking amongst the women entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, one of the things that I do is I try to bring you know, women from different portfolio companies sort of together and onto each other's boards or advisory boards. And we're trying to do that more and more because I think, you know, again, the more that you get you know, sort of women onto boards um, and engaging at that level, 
it starts to, um, you know, it sort of starts to change the way that they're thinking about their own business and other businesses and angel investing and, you know, and and then you know hopefully um, you know at some point they'll either get into the venture business or just be you know mentors, met great mentors and, and angel investors. Which you know again I think that um, uh, it's no you know secret when you see people who um, look like yourself, it, it makes it more comfortable to be um, you know pursuing that activity. So.